Spirit is coming, and the Holy Spirit will never, ever leave. Jesus starts saying his goodbyes here in chapter 13. Judas's betrayal becomes divine confirmation that the hour is at hand. Some of us try to lose our minds when people stab us in the back, but it's only a sign that God is about to do something greater for us in our lives. Whenever you experience a Judas moment, tell the person, thank you, because you're setting the stage for me to go higher. Don't give them too much power over you. Know that no weapon that forms against you will ever prosper. Jesus never said the weapon wouldn't form. He said the weapon wouldn't prosper. Careful Bible readers notice that as soon as Judas leaves the communion table, Jesus says, so the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. In general, the glory of God refers to God's worth, God's greatness, God's power, God's majesty, everything in God that causes us to reverence, worship, and adore God. While God's glory was displayed throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, through signs and through wonders, you know, it all got started in the Gospel of John with water into wine, right? He kept the party going. This all comes to a climax on Calvary's cross. The chief characteristic of God that's revealed in Jesus' death on the cross is love, a self-sacrificing, limitless love. He devoted that sacred head for people like you and me who weren't even thinking about him when he did it. Thank God he first loved us. Calvary's cross is a stark revelation of divine glory. The empty cross signifies the unique, unprecedented, and unsurpassed resurrection of Christ Jesus after death, burial, and a sealed tomb. Not just a little tomb that he could have easily got out of if he had been passed out, like some like to say, but a sealed tomb with a stone that it took more than one person to roll in, so it had to take the power of God to roll away. And until he laid down his life, Jesus was limited by time and space like you and me. Crucifixion and resurrection enabled him to be everywhere at once in the Spirit. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ living in us? The moment we put our faith in Christ, we get the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. Don't walk around with your head hanging down feeling like you're defeated. God is in you and you have victory. Fight for your victory knowing that you already have victory. All the while that Jesus was in the flesh dwelling among us, he could only be in one place at one time. And that's why people got so excited when he came on the scene. It was blind Bartimaeus' one chance to see when Jesus was leaving Jericho and traveling along that highway. That's why he started shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The Canaanite woman had no hope for her daughter's deliverance from demon possession until Jesus came through the region of Tyre and Sidon. And that's why she went to him and said, I need you to do something for me. And it was the ten lepers' only hope for healing when Jesus passed on the border of Samaria and Galilee. That's why they started shouting, and one of them had the sense to come back and say thank you. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus wouldn't have had to wait four days for Jesus to get to Bethany if he wasn't limited by the constraints of flesh and blood. But once he returned to the Father, he was able to send the Holy Spirit to take up residence in the hearts of believers everywhere. In our text for today, after receiving divine confirmation that his hour had come, a deliberate and a compassionate Jesus is speaking to 11 of the 12 disciples. They're continuing the departure conversation. Back in chapter 16 again, Jesus tells the 11, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I don't go, the Holy Ghost won't come. But when I go, I will send him to you. Jesus isn't the first person in the Bible, or even in human history for that matter, to give a farewell speech. In the Old Testament, we see Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, and David all saying their goodbyes. Each of these conversations follows a similar pattern. The speaker, whoever he or she may be when they're saying farewell, begins by telling of their imminent death. 
Joshua starts his farewell speech by saying, I'm old and well advanced in years. Then the speaker offers comfort in the face of the grief that the announcement brings. Jesus himself said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The next common element in a farewell discourse is to predict what's going to come in the future and to give instructions on how to behave in light of the prediction. Moses tells the children of Israel how to live in the promised land after they cross over the Jordan River. And often the discourse concludes with a prayer for those who are being left behind. Do you know chapter 17 of John's gospel is Jesus' high priestly prayer for the people that God has given to him? That means it's for you and for me. There are many common elements in a farewell discourse. And Jesus, as he often did during his earthly ministry because he said he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, follows the pattern to a point. He talks about his fast approaching death, he offers comfort, he predicts what's going to happen, he gives instructions on how to live, and he concludes with a prayer. All of that is what everybody else did. But because Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, is both human and divine, he wanted and needed to say goodbye, but he couldn't do it like everybody else because he's not like anybody else. He was indeed going to die. No longer would he be walking the dusty roads of ancient Palestine, healing the sick, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, unstopping deaf ears, restoring broken relationships. All of that was going to be in the past, in the flesh. Jesus, the man who got hungry, got thirsty, got tired, was about to be crucified. Yet, at the same time, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, God's anointed one, God's one and only begotten son, who was older than his mother, the same age as his father, the creator of the star that shone the night that he was born, was going back to glory. So there had to be a major difference between how he says goodbye and how everybody else says goodbye. Jesus, the one who's preparing his disciples for his departure, can be heard saying, I'll see you soon as part of his farewell discourse. No one else on their deathbed can make that claim without fear of successful contradiction. Listen to Jesus in John 16, 16. In a little while, you'll see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. This not only confuses the 11, it frustrates them. They start murmuring and talking amongst themselves. They ask each other, what is he talking about now? Oftentimes when Jesus taught in crowds and he taught in parables, the 12 missed the meaning. They would ask Jesus later when they got in private, could you please unpack that parable, that story that you told earlier? We didn't get what you were saying. But something different about this day and this discourse was going on. He wasn't speaking to a crowd. He wasn't speaking in code. He was talking directly to them. And they still didn't understand. They asked each other, what in the world? They answered each other, we have no idea. By the time we get to verse 25, with the cross staring Jesus in the face, he knows he has to make it plain because time is running out and he didn't pick the brightest bunch. It had to be music to their ears when he said, a time is coming when I will tell you plainly about my father. How many times during the last three years did they go to him in private and say, make it plain, Jesus? And each time, he did it for them. He explained the meaning because they were the ones that needed to carry on the message. And that's why we need Sunday school and Bible study. If we're going to be witnesses, we have to know the meaning. Amen? Can I pause for just a moment parenthetically to say that one of my favorite passages in Scripture is James 1, verse 5. You know what it says there? If you ever lack wisdom, ask God, and God will give it to you freely. God won't embarrass you. God won't make you feel stupid for asking. God will give you what you need when you don't know what to do. And this is why Jesus was patient with his followers, because love is patient. Love is kind. It's what he says in verse 26 that starts to shout me, though. When the Holy Spirit comes, that's what in that day means. 
When the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in your heart, you will speak directly to the Father in my name. You don't need me as an intermediary. You don't need the high priest in the day of atonement that only came once a year until I go to the cross and do what I'm going to do. Do you know how complicated it was to talk to God back then before Jesus went to the cross and before that curtain was torn in two? One day a year on the day of atonement, the high priest needed two bulls, one to sacrifice, one to put the pray over everything that was wrong with the people and put it on the animal's head so the animal would be led out of the city and over a cliff. And it could only happen one day, one time a year. The priest had to go into the Holy of Holies and only the high priest could do it. And they believed the presence of God was so thick in the Holy of Holies that if there was anything wrong with the priest, if the priest hadn't confessed all of his sins, he would drop dead in the Holy of Holies. So they had these little bells on the priest's robe so you could hear the priest in there walking around, sprinkling the blood from the first goat on the mercy seat. The bells were ringing and the blood was being sprinkled. And if you didn't hear those bells ringing anymore, the priest had a rope tied around one ankle because there was nobody else who could go in there. They knew that. So they would pull the priest out by the rope if the priest's heart wasn't right. Can you imagine what it sounded like in the ears to these brothers who knew that system, that they would speak directly with God on their own in the name of Jesus? You can't even imagine it because you've never had to go through all of that. Because of Christ, all you have to do is say, Lord, have mercy. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's going to offer himself as our once and for all time atoning sacrifice. No more turtle doves, no more bulls, no more goats, none of that. Those of us who have come to Christ on the other side of Calvary's cross have an up-close, personal, and intimate relationship with God. But before Good Friday... Before the resurrection on Sunday morning, before the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the promised Holy Spirit, people did not have direct access to God. Right here, Jesus is prophesying. In the New International Version, we see the same English word twice. It says ask in both the A and the B clause in verse 26, which is where we're going to hang out. Jesus says, you will ask in my name. That's about telling the 11, you're going to be able to make a request of God. After I am glorified, after I am raised, after my ascension, when I'm seated at the Father making intercessions for you, you will be able to ask God for stuff in my name. Then in the B clause, he says, I'm not saying that I'm going to ask the Father on your behalf. This word in the B clause is a different meaning of the word ask. This is the word of to petition, to get permission. Although it looks like the same word in English, it's two different words in the original language. And the first word when he says you can ask is ato. It has to do with making a request of somebody equal. Now, I don't see y'all, like you're not really getting this. I'm, I'm going to say it again. I want you to wait. I want you to just shout when I say this again. Jesus says y'all who ain't worthy, me, who ain't worthy, can make a request to God as though we are equal because of him. Do you get that? You are seen as equal to God because you put your faith in Christ Jesus. You still don't get it, so I'm going to have to preach a little while longer. In red letters, Jesus is saying when the Holy Spirit comes, believers are going to be able to go to God as if they are equal to God. God who is high and lifted up above all the earth, who created everything, and those of us who, some of us can't even make a meal, are going to be able to talk to God like we are equal. The God who made everything out of nothing, and those of us who have a whole lot and don't do a whole lot with it, can talk to God as though we are on the same level. Before Calvary's cross, Jesus told his followers, after I'm glorified, you can speak to the creator of the universe in my name as if you are peers. I get it. It's an extremely difficult thing to comprehend because on our own, we know we're not worthy. But in Christ 
and with the Spirit in us, we are able to ato God. Let me see if I can make it plain. The word ato is the word that's used in the gospel every time that they write about Jesus praying to the Father. Jesus, the second person in the three-person Godhead. God the Father, the creator of the universe. God the Son, our Redeemer. God the Holy Spirit, our sustainer. Jesus atos God all the time. It's like a brother asking his sister, can we trade chores today? Or co-workers asking each other, I got something to do this week, can you take my shift? While on earth, Jesus prayed to the Father as an equal because he was in the beginning with God and everything that was created was created when God said, let there be, when God spoke a word and he is the word, made flesh, so he could ato God. But the second ask in verse 26b is eroteo. It means to request something of a superior. A better translation would be to petition God. You know when somebody wants to run for office, they have to get a petition signed and they need so many signatures to show that the people want them to do it. They need permission. In verse 26b, Jesus is saying, I'm no longer going to have to petition God for you. You can do it for yourself. A child has to request permission from a parent to have a sleepover because the child doesn't own the house and therefore can't determine everything that's going to go on in the house. An employee has to request vacation time from an employer, because you can't just say, I'm gonna be out and still get your check. A petition is a formal request. Eroteo is how you and I ought to have to address God, because we're not equal to God. It's the way a subordinate would address a superior. But in today's text, Jesus is saying that after I go back to heaven, when the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in you, the relationship between heaven and redeemed humanity is going to be altered forever. This is shouting stuff. We ought to raise the roof in this place because on the day of Pentecost, May 28th, the fourth Sunday, 50 days after the resurrection, is the birthday of the church. It's the day when the church celebrates and commemorates the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit makes it possible for you and me to talk to God whenever we want to. I was moving last weekend, and I know I called Jesus' name 75,000 times. Every time, so I said, now come on, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Why, Jesus? This, Jesus. You have any idea how radical that is? If we were Catholic, we'd be in a line waiting to get in a little booth and tell somebody else so they could tell somebody else. As I was writing this message about our ability to ato God, I had a hard time trying to think of something to illustrate this point. So I hope and I pray that I'm talking to some Dr. Seuss fans this morning. Anybody like Dr. Seuss? Amen, amen, amen. You know how small the who was compared to Horton, the elephant, and Horton hears a who? There was a whole town called Whoville in a little speck on one flower in a field of flowers communicating with a big old elephant. Can you imagine an ant or a gnat talking to you today when you go outside? It's a difficult concept and that's why you're laughing. We are so small and God is so big. Any Seinfeld fans in the room, if you don't like, see? People tell me that I can't use Seinfeld illustrations in the black church. Yes, I can. Do you remember the Briss episode? Stan and Myra, they were a Jewish couple, and they wanted Jerry and Elaine to be the godparents of their newborn baby boy. Jerry only knew Stan from playing softball. Didn't even know him a long time. Elaine knew Myra even less because all they did was sit in the stands and watch them play. They didn't even go to practice. Stan and Myra were acquaintances of Jerry and Elaine. They weren't friends and they didn't have a whole lot in common. So Jerry and Elaine got alone and said, why did they pick us? Don't they have any real friends? They came to the conclusion that Stan and Myra were level jumping. They weren't really friends, but they wanted to reap the rewards of being friends. My brothers and my sisters, Jesus came so you and I could level jump.
We are not and we never will be equal to God. We're imperfect and God is perfect. We're sinners and God is holy. We're unreliable because of our inconsistencies and our instabilities. One day you can count on us, the next day you can't. God is a reliable resource because he changes not and his compassions, they fail not. God is consistent in character yesterday, today, tomorrow, and evermore. In spite of all of these differences, because of Christ Jesus, the created, the creatures, you and I, can approach the creator on equal footing. Our relationship with Jesus enables us to jump many, 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 many levels. Our connection to Christ makes us friends of God. We have direct access to an intimacy with God. And it's only because God loves us that we have this access. Jesus didn't come into the world to make God love humanity. He came because God loves humanity. The world in John 3.16 is you and me and every other human being walking around on this earth. And it was because God loved us that he gave his only begotten son. Oftentimes in our attempts to describe the work of Christ, we make it sound like Jesus' death on the cross changed God's attitude toward us, and that's not right. Calvary didn't transform God from an angry God to a loving God. Today's text, Jesus says, the Father himself loves you. Jesus came not because God so hated the world, but because God so loved the world. Jesus is the gift that came bearing a gift. He is literally God's gift to this world. He came bearing a gift. He brings the love of God to whosoever would believe in him. He brings the gift of eternal life so that if we've ever had the privilege to hear a loved one say goodbye, or even if a loved one was taken without a farewell, if they believed in God and we believe in God, we will see them again. That's how Jesus could say it is finished on that fateful Friday that we now call good. Because living, he showed us God's love in action. He came from the Father to show us, to show the world, the love of the Father. By way of, recross, of the cross, he returned to the Father with his mission accomplished. And as a result of that ascension, after the resurrection, we have intimacy. It's been restored. It was broken in the garden when they did the one thing that God said not to do. And it was restored when Jesus gave his life for ours. The Holy Spirit is in the heart of anyone who would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you don't know him today and you say, I'm going to give my life to Christ, you will have the Holy Spirit in you the moment you make your confession of faith. And then you'll have direct access to God. With the aid of the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can go to God in the name of Jesus, and it is shouting stuff. God's one and only Son became human like us, so we could become children of God like him. And while he was in his earthly body, he told his disciples, the Father loves you because you love me and you believe the Father sent me. Those who love and receive Christ are loved by God. And that is why, if they were willing, but they might not be, these deacons could come back up here if they wanted to and sing, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freed me forever, and one day he's coming back and it's going to be a glorious, glorious day. The doors of the church are open. We say it traditionally, the truth is they have never been closed. Living Christ Jesus loved us and he loved us so much that he laid down his life. So I am extending to you an invitation to discipleship. Throughout this entire message, I kept emphasizing that Jesus said this before he went to the cross. Sometimes I envy the people in Scripture because they got to walk around with Jesus and do stuff with Jesus. But because I can go to him directly on my own, I'm not envious of that at all. The moment we receive him, if you dare to come today, if you're online, if you're in the room, and you say, I receive Jesus as my Savior, we will pray with you. We will pray for you. 
you will come to know him, but automatically you'll have direct access. Will there be one who wants to approach the great big God who created the universe in the name of their big brother? We offer Christ to you. Let us pray. God, you promised that your word could not go forth without accomplishing the purpose for which you send it. We believe you send it to save, to set free, to deliver, to comfort, to meet every person at the point of their need. So we pray now, if there's anyone who does not know Jesus as their savior, they would come right now. Amen. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord, for you are worthy to be praised. We worship God in a different way. Um, it's offering time. Uh, that, that was pretty weak. That was pretty weak. It's offering time. That's, that's a little better. That's a little better. Let's try it one more time. It's offering time. All right, all right, all right. That's better. That's better. That's better. That's better. Okay, um, it's time to take up our morning offering. Um, there's three ways you can give here. I see our screen is finally working. Um, you can give through the Tidely app. You can mail it in, 315 West 7th Street. But the West, best way to give is to give in person. We would love to see you here bringing your offerings to the altar. So we just encourage you as we uh, uh, give our offering this morning to come forward. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this time that we would just bring our offerings to you. We just pray that they would be used for the building of your kingdom, Heavenly Father. We pray for the hands that would be taking care of it, and the Father, they would use it. And the Father, we just thank and praise you for what you have provided for us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Follow the usher's direction. <laughs> you can stand so you can loosen up some of that change you're holding down in their pocket. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, he is good. For he is worthy, worthy. For he is good, yes, he is good. For he is worthy, worthy. For he is good, yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good, yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. We give you thanks, Lord, for this offering that we have received. We thank you for those who have uh, 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 brought it forth, Heavenly Father. We just thank you for what you continue to bless us with, that we will just give back a portion to you. You don't ask us for much, Heavenly Father. You ask us just for a portion. 
So we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Reverend Patterson come to give us our benediction, I just have a few announcements uh, from, uh, from Pastor. I'm going to take these out of context, I mean out of, out of order that he gave me, because I want to do this one first. Um, on the piano over there, there are some absentee ballots. Next week we will be having our quarterly meeting as well as we will be voting on the pastor uh, to be our permanent pastor here. So if you're not going to be here next week, those orange or yellow looking papers on the piano, please fill it out. And Zoanne, I believe I was told, had some envelopes. So you can get an envelope from, get the ballot first and get an envelope from Zoanne. What, hold the envelopes over there? Okay, you put it over there, okay. Envelopes are there and the ballots are there. So grab a ballot. If you're not going to be here next week to vote in person, you can get an absentee ballot over there to vote on the pastor. We also have our quarterly meeting next uh, Sunday as well. So there'll be two meetings. It'll be one meeting, but it'll be two meetings, if you know what I mean. Okay? <laughs> we have one gathering, but there'll be two meetings. I'll put it that way there. It's a better way to explain it. Okay, um, Tuesday is Bible study via Zoom. Please try to make your presence there. We have a wonderful time in Bible study every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Friday, this Friday, the men will continue our mentoring of uh, young men. So at 7 o'clock, we will we'll be meeting, I guess, again in the Blue Room. And uh, so all young men... Uh, and if you know a young man that you would like to have us mentor, please have them in the Blue Room Friday at 7 o'clock. Our Saturday, we're having our church cleanup, which will be at 9 a.m. Um, everything's in place, Darkie? Okay, we hope, hope everything is in place. Please try to make your presence. Many hands make light work. So if you can on Saturday at 9 a.m., come so that we can clean the church. Our spring cleaning, winter cleaning, fall cleaning, whatever, we need to clean this church. There's a lot of things that needs to be taken care of and cleaned in this church. Uh, next Sunday is Reconciliation Sunday. Um, it's the fifth Sunday where we have um, ex-offenders, uh, prisoners coming, it's our prison ministry Sunday. And we invite, if you know someone that was previously incarcerated and you want them to be, come and be encouraged, we want them to know that they have a home here where they can come on Sundays and not, not be judged. We want them to come and be in fellowship with us. So next Sunday is Reconciliation Sunday. Please, if you know someone, uh, uh, call someone and let them know that we're having a Reconciliation Sunday next Sunday. Um, one other thing that's not on here, I saw our fine ushers uh, standing on the post and they are dressed and ready. We desire to have a ushers meeting, but we just want to try to get things organized and in place. So I, I haven't spoken to the pastor. We haven't decided on a date. I should say we talked about it in Deacon's meeting, but we haven't decided on a date. But we'd like to have the ushers meeting so that we can just get things organized and put in place. So that, that's upcoming. I'm going to try to do it the second Sunday, maybe in the Blue Room. But I, as I said, I haven't spoke to the pastor about a date. We spoke about it, but not a date. So if we can meet in Blue Room second Sunday next month, uh, and we can get some things organized and together. I believe that's it in the way of announcements that I have. We're going to uh, pray that Reverend Patterson will come and give us our benediction. We pray for her. She has to go to another. Oh, Fish and Loaves is this Saturday, too, as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on on Saturday. So Fish and Loaves on Saturday 
at three, Brother Maurice, three o'clock, okay? Um, Reverend Patterson has to go to another service, so we pray for her traveling mercies, and we thank her for coming this morning. Uh, give her a hand. Let us look to the Lord, now unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we can ask, think, or even imagine, according to the power that's at work in us, to him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power in the world without end, in the church forevermore, and the people of God said, Amen. We enter to worship, we depart to serve, God bless you. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken, so let the church say amen. Let Tristan get all of the mics. Let Tristan get all of the mics. May I have your attention, please, one